Stanford University. Today we have uh, uh, Philippe Bernet from the Helmholtz, Helmholtz, Helmholtz Centrum Berlin. Obviously, I don't speak German. Um, so he's uh, an old timer in this uh, in this field. I think uh, uh, he's been he's done many beam times at LCLS, mostly at SXR, I believe. Um, in fact, I remember uh, sharing beam with uh, you mm -hmm. guys when we were at CXI. I think it was um, a pre pretty terrible experiment for us. Uh, we had no, no beam uh, through four days, basically. <laughs> uh, so we, we experienced uh, uh, the day-to-day the, uh, -day work here. Uh, so he's going to tell us about uh, chemistry, in particular uh, about how to use the FELs uh, and X-ray spectroscopy to map uh, chemical interactions. And uh, after his talk, uh, we'll move on to, to lunch, which is going to be across the hall uh, in the room next door. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, as Mariano said, I'm from Helmholtz Centrum Berlin, which uh, is a research center maybe comparable to SLAC, where we operate and use the soft X-ray synchrotron BASI-2. And maybe that's a name that, that is more familiar to some of you. Now, <coughs> I've been here many times indeed. And I can say that it's always exciting to be here. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here today. Mariano, thanks, you, thanks, thanks a lot for the invitation and the opportunity to um, present my view of chemical dynamics. It is also exciting because if you land here, I mean, wh when could you see your own experiment when landing? I find that amazing. This was yesterday taken from the plane when I landed. Here is LCLS. And um, this shows that uh, the, the scale of the whole thing. I really like that. I like large experiments, I have to say. <clears throat> so before we start, I would like to know, I would like to ask you a question, which is, may sound a bit strange, but I would like to know how many of you by training are physicists? Yeah, devastating majority. How many are chemists? And how many are biologists? always the same thing. I don't believe it. But anyway, for the physicists, you will have to learn some chemistry taught by a physicist. And for the chemists, I hope you don't, you, 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 know, you won't be bo bo bored. And maybe you can correct me. <clears throat> we do have microphones and um, the talk is split into three parts. The first part is going to be about some fundamentals. The second part about an experiment we did in the lab, very brief, only five or 10 minutes, but it sets the stage. And the third part is about an experiment we did at LCLS. The paper came out last year. The experiment was done six years ago, just to give you a feeling for how long it takes. No, that is an extreme case, I guess. <clears throat> I would like you to interrupt me at any time. There are microphones, as said, and since the room is so stupidly big, Please don't um, uh, hesitate to go to the microphone. It may sound strange to take the microphone and so on. Pass it on, help each other, and that um, microphone shouldn't prevent us from getting in touch with, with each other. Each part at the end of the part has a, a little quiz where um, we'll get in contact and uh, discuss. But as I said, during the presentation for each part, don't hesitate to interrupt if you want to know more details. There is further reading in the extra slides, and there is also more, um, like I suggest, books and um, more slides that detail some of the aspects, because it's impossible in one and a half hours to cover everything. And um, since this is chemistry at FELs, I will have to say that I only cover X-ray spectroscopy. There are other talks and other slides and other X-ray methods and even methods without X-rays, which are very useful also to study chemical dynamics. Um, so this is a very subjective view on how to study chemistry with an FEL. First of all, one of the motivation, uh, one of the obvious motivation is we want to see those atoms move. Ah, I'm sorry, I will go here from time to time to have a look at my watch, which I forgot to start. Now, seeing the atoms move, of course, is a big dream. And I don't have to say that the problem here, of course, is there is no, micro no, no microscope whatsoever in the world that could make those simulations um, real, that to see those atoms move is not so easy. So how can we come close to this? If you talk about chemical dynamics, you have to mention this person. This is Ahmed Sewail, 
who um, in 1999 got the Nobel Prize for his studies of transient states of chemical reactions using femtosecond spectroscopy. And this is one of the applications of pump probe spectroscopy, which should be, um, which should be, um, uh, which should be familiar to most of you, where you use a pump pulse to excite the system, Ah, it's this one, um, and a probe pulse to basically film it to make a movie and you delay the pulses to uh, get images at different instances in time during the reaction. And those, um, those strips, you will see them, those movie strips, you will see them a lot, also on the LCLS homepage, of course, because one of the main uh, applications of an, an FAL is actually to get these movies. But if you think about it, what are we actually talking about? And I want to make one slide here to distinguish be between kinetics and dynamics. So what we're talking about when we talk about chemical dynamics is the atomic scale view of elementary steps of a chemical reaction. And those are on the pico to femtosecond time scale, atomic time scales if you want, and the angstrom length scale, uh, um, atomic length scale. This could be triggered by uh, a triggered reaction, uh, triggered by a pump pulse, or it could be a non-triggered reaction, which is then thermally activated. Most often we talk about photo reactions and they are triggered. In chemistry, most of chemistry is actually equilibrium chemistry. And that means um, we can uh, come up with a rate constant uh, that relates products and reactants. We can see whether energy is released, like in this case, or consumed when it goes the other way around. Um, there is the famous transition state theory that relates this little increase, this activation barrier, if you want, to um, the outcome of the reaction. And um, the most important details are here. The thermodynamic properties of this properties of the transition state here um, and the crossing frequency, how often the system goes over that barrier, determine the reaction rate of the kinetics. This is not what we're going to talk about. There is more slides in the extra reading, and this is what most people learn also in chemistry. Here we talk about the energy potential landscape that determines the reaction mechanism. And it is important to, to note that transition state theory fails for photochemical um, reactions simply because intermediates with very short lifetimes are involved. So what we're talking about here is the atomic scale view or the atomic scale dynamics of chemical interactions. Uh, the most important or the most famous textbook example for this is the sodium iodide dimer. You see how the molecule here in this energy potential landscape um, you excite it from the ground state to an excited state, then it can either um, oscillate back and forth, which gives this oscillatory feature here, or it can dissociate um, to uh, a covalent, um, uh, to um, a sodium atom or iodine atom, and this would be then this signal here. Um, what's important here to note, that's the only message for this slide, and we're going into detail here, is that the movement or the motion occurs on a one angstrom per 100 femtosecond time scale because this is the time scale at which atomic nuclei are moving. Why should we actually bother about that? Why should we make that visible? Why should we actually look at atoms, how they move around? I think there's a very simple reason, and that is it is the key to answering fundamental questions in solar energy conversion. There are more motivations and more, more reasons than that. But if you just look at Slack, <clears throat> with, for instance, this book on X-ray free electron lasers, edited by Junko Jano, Vilja Chandra, and Uwe Bergmann, Uwe is from, is from Slack, or you look at the end of that week, Thursday and Friday, there is a workshop specifically on those questions, fundamental questions in solar energy conversion. And all the time they have that here at Slack, not because it's fun, but because it's really important to see those atoms move in order to explain how light with molecules and a metal, for instance, is converted into a new molecule is essential and very important for human mankind, I believe. That really is the case. In this system, once it's absorbed light, there is a dynamic interplay of electron excitation, electron density, and spin. It goes on, it goes on from femtoseconds to milliseconds, and the big question is how can we make use, best use, of this light in order to make efficiently one molecule into another? So if you think about it, if you lean back and think about it, there are two very important processes that we need to understand in order to answer those fundamental questions in solar energy conversion. And this is the fundamentals that I would like to um, discuss with you over the next 20 minutes or so. And those are first electronic excitation. What happens um, or how does the molecule actually absorb the light, visible light? 
And second, ultra-fast relaxation, or relaxation processes in molecules that could be ultra-fast. Because we need to know what the molecule does after it absorbs the light in order to actually control, ultimately, um, how to make new molecules out of this. So let's come close to these two questions. Let's start with the first. In order to um, understand it, we need to understand graphs like this one. This is now from a German uh, book, but you can easily find that in, in other uh, books as well. And it displays two um, energy, potential energy curves. One for, for, for a diatomic uh, system. It's a schematic representation of the energy levels of a diatomic molecule. Here you see the electronic ground state, the electronic excited state, you see vibrational levels, and you see rotational levels on top. Two things are important. First of all, um, we want to understand what happens if the system goes from one to the other electronic state. We're not dealing with vibrations and rotations in detail here. Um, the, the, the energy scale that we're talking about is shown here nicely in this book by um, Swanberg. The difference in energy between, for instance, the electronic ground and, ele and an excited electronic state is several electron volts. That is our, t that is our energy scale. We're interested in, in in systems, how they change on this time scale, on this energy scale here, we're not talking about vibrational differences, 0.1 eV, or rotational differences, 0.001 electron volts. So those are very important energy scales here. Second, as you see, what's then most important for us are the two thick black lines. So how do we actually come to these thick black lines? How, would you con how do we construct the, uh, the, the potential energy landscape. That is the problem here that I would like to discuss with you. Um, and that, in order to understand that, we have to understand two things. First, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, probably the most important approximation in molecular physics. And second, frank Compton factors. So let's do that um, in the next uh, 10 minutes here. First of all, when we describe chemical interactions, when we describe chemical interactions, what we usually do, yeah, by forming molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals. And now you should, you should think about your lectures where you have hydrogen 1s, hydrogen 1s, forming bonding and antibonding orbitals. That's what I'm talking about here. When we describe that, when we do that, we often assume implicitly or explicitly that the nuclei are at rest. They are not moving. Now we need to drop exactly that approximation because we want to take into account that the molecule relaxes and moves, and also that electronic energy is transferred into kinetic energy of the nuclei in order to, for the molecule to be able to relax. So we need to drop that approximation. Nuclear movements are now part of the problem. Unfortunately, <clears throat> this leads to a quantum mechanical problem that is not analytically solvable. You can't write down the equation and then calculate um, the energy of your system. It's impossible. It is possible for H2 plus, two nuclei, one electron. One electron more, impossible. Big molecules like we're interested in, completely impossible. That's where we need the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And this is um, actually the big, um, the big breakthrough here from this Born-Oppenheimer approximation that you can treat in a useful way even big molecules with this. That's the... Um, original publication. So the Born-Oppenheimer approximation basically says we neglect the coupling of nuclear. So each of these sentences is hardcore in a sense that you should really think about it carefully. We we'll just run through it once together and you could still think about it or read books around it um, later. So we neglect the coupling of nuclear and electronic motion. By doing that we can treat the motion of nuclei and electrons independently. That's the starting point of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Why can we do that? Well, simply because the mass of electrons in nuclei is so different. The difference is 10 to 4. It's so different that the nuclei actually appear to be fixed while electrons are moving. With this, we can solve the Schrodinger equation for the, electron, for the electrons in the static potential of fixed nuclei, nuclei fixed in space. We call that Produktansatz. I think it's the same thing in English when you write um, the wave function of the molecule as just a product of electronic and nuclear wave function. By putting that in, ah yeah, one thing, it's very important to realize that the electronic part of the, of the wave function, this psi e here, depends on the nuclear coordinates, that's the big R, but as a parameter, not as a variable. And I'll tell you what that means. 
So it means within this um, adiabatic approximation where the electrons follow the nuclear motions instantaneously, we can solve the Schrodinger equation for psi e at fixed r and then we do that repeatedly for different nuclear positions. We do it once for a certain nuclear distance, another time for a larger, larger, even larger. So the, the big R, the, different, the distance of the nuclei is a parameter but it's not a variable. The position of the electrons is the variable. This is our Schrodinger equation. Kinetic energy, potential energy of the electrons at a fixed distance of nuclei equals the energy of the system times the wave function of the electrons. And by simply plotting the resulting set of solutions of the energies for different differences, we construct the potential energy curves. And it's uh, important to know that we saw this black curve that was a smooth curve. If you calculate it in real, it's not a curve, it's actually dots. It's dots at different nuclear distances that you then connect to make a line. And the, the shorter the distance between the dots, the smoother your curve will be. Uh, this, for a diatomic molecule, is a curve. For um, more molecule, for, for um, um, atoms, I'm sorry, in molecules with more than two atoms, uh, it would be surfaces, it could be a landscape, whatever, depending on the parameters and the reaction coordinates. We'll come to that. So in the essence, this is what we come to, the, the, bleak, the, the thick black lines, the potential energy curves here. And um, these potential energy curves, E versus R, correspond to the electronic part of the total energy of the molecule plus the energy arising from repulsion of the nuclei. That's very important. So that part is still in. However, vibrational and rotational energies of the molecules are not included in this representation here. Let me just have a look at the watch. Good. Now comes the question, how do we now that we have the thick black curves, how do we explain, how do we, how do we describe the electronic excitation? This is where the frank Conton principle uh, comes in. We don't have the time to derive the matrix element. By the way, we're exclusively, flow, exclusively focusing on dipole uh, transitions because we only, so we live in the dipole approximation. It's the most common case, in particular the one that applies to describing how molecules absorb visible light. In the dipole approximation, you can in all those books that I'm giving you, suggesting you read nicely how those matrix, matrix elements are derived. In very brief, the essence basically is that the transition between a state X and A, so this is a molecular physics notation, X is the ground state, A is the excited state, let's just call it like that, it's shorter than writing ground state in the excited state. With vibrational levels epsilon, the transition probability of the electronic dipole transition is proportional to two important factors. One is the electronic dipole moment, you, you recognize this, the dipole operator starting and ending point or initial and final state. And the other one is this weird overlap integral. It really, I made it in two notations so that you can choose the one you want, the, the one you like, the bracket or the one with the integrals. This is just an overlap integral of nuclear wave functions for different vibrational levels zero and epsilon, epsilon, I'm sorry. And the point here is, we'll do that, or we'll illustrate that with a common case. First, we start with harmonic oscillators. No anharmonicity, like in real life. Harmonic potential in the ground state, harmonic potential in the excited state. We have different vibrational levels. In the electronic ground state, only the vibrational ground state is plotted. And those curves up here are the, um, the nuclear wave functions as you get them from solving the nuclear part of the Schrödinger equation in our born approximation. The classic or the, the common case is where A, the minimum of A is shifted to larger distances compared to X. And this is also simply understandable. You excite a system, you relocate charges, you basically weaken the bond and that means the potential is shifted to right to higher energies. At the bond distance, at the equilibrium distance you had before, now the energy is really high. It actually wants to move apart from each other. And in order to now estimate the transition probability, not only do you need the electric dipole moment or the electronic dipole moment, you also need to evaluate this overlap integral. Remember the quantum uh, mechanical harmonic oscillator. Those are the wave functions in this potential and they are drawn here. 
And in order to evaluate the transition probability, you need to evaluate this overlap integral, which can be actually done visually without calculating. You just overlap in your head now this curve with all those curves up there. You will realize that there is quite some overlap from zero to zero. There is not so much overlap here, but then it increases and it goes down again. And you get this shape. From zero to zero, you have something. From zero to one, it's quite bigger. From zero to two, that's where the biggest overlap is. And then it decreases again because the number of oscillations increases. Of course, you, do, you can do it correctly. And then you will get basically this shape, which basically just means for the different cases, same position shifted to the left, I think, shifted to the right. You can see which transition is strongest. And those numbers S are just the overlap integrals as evaluated here and visually here. This is just 0, 0 is the strongest. And then all others, there's always positive and negative overlapping with positive, which means all others are 0. So like that, you can very conceptually simply evaluate frank Compton factors and actually derive the shape of your spectrum. That's the point. The electronic dipole moment determines the strength of the transition in general and the frank Compton factors determine the shape of your spectrum. Now, before we come to an example, the real case and harmonic potentials. And <clears throat> we do the first step towards relaxation. Now we know how to describe the system. We know how to describe the electronic excitation. The question is what happens once the molecule absorbs that photon. You do the excitation from the electronic ground state to the electronic excited state. Ah, so, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. The weird thing here is you do an electronic excitation and at the same time you're getting a vibrational excitation in your system. That sounds a bit weird, but it's understandable because you're loosening the force, you're changing the force constants in your system and the system is reacting to this changed force constants in terms of vibrations. That's one way of seeing it. That's why you have vibrational structure, vibrational excitations in your system once you excited it. Now, um, every system in the gas phase, in particular in solution, will always couple to the environment. Internally, the system can, by internal conversion, and each of these um, acronyms, each of these terms here, is precisely defined, and you will find them in the extra slides, can release energy by coupling different degrees of freedom. You excite the system, certain vibrations are excited, they couple to bend, a vibra to, to, um, bend vibrations, leading to a redistribution of energy, for instance. You can also have intramolecular, that's intramolecular vibrational distribution. You can also have inter-system crossing, we're coming to that, or thermalization simply. In solution, you couple to the surrounding, energy gets dissipated in the surrounding. The essence is you will have a sequence of radiationless transitions, all these transitions, how the system gets rid of energy are radiationless, no photon is emitted. And it allows the system to come back to the, to the vibrational ground state in the electronic excited state. Then you can go down back to the, to the, to the electronic ground state by emitting a photon that then fluoresces. And the essential point here is the absorption spectrum and the fluorescent spectrum are shifted with respect to each other and the fluorescent spectrum is always redshifted because of this relaxation in the excited state. By the way, this book by Haken and Wolf, Molecular Physics and Elements of Quantum Chemistry, I think is excellent and describes this probably much better than I do here. What this leads to is a complicated term diagram, energy level diagram of a molecule. It's complicated and, and it, takes, it would take an hour to discuss all the things, but there are some essential ingredients in here. We absorb from an electronic to an excited state or to this one. We can have internal conversion, which basically means getting rid of vibrational or electronic energy. We can have inter-system crossing where the system changes spin. Here you see a singlet, here you see a triplet state of the system. And we could have then phosphorescence. We could also have absorption into those triplet states, many different things. Each of those processes, conversion, inter-system crossing, and so on, is related with a certain time scale that usually reaches from femto to pico and nanoseconds. And many of these time scales for many of the systems we're interested in are actually unknown. In particular, this part, inter-system crossing, how a system in an excited state goes from a singlet to a triplet state, often is not well known. 
and is a topic of current research and part of that um, is currently investigated at LCLS actually to determine those time scales. This is a famous example, so we're making a jump from a textbook here to a recent paper in 2003 from Jim McCusker. And um, I usually choose that example because it's a good one, but I still again want to make the connection. At the workshop at the end of the week, Jim McCusker is giving a talk on exactly that topic because it's really a topic that he wants to know that we want to know. So let's have a look at this system. One metal, in the, one metal atom, ruthenium in the middle, nitrogens and some ligands around. We don't care about the details. The point is the absorption spectrum is, is different systems, right? I mean, um, dashed, solid, and so on. Let's look at the system with the solid line. The system with the solid line has an absorption that peaks at 450 nanometers. The fluorescence peaks at 600, redshifted. As expected, there is relaxation in the excited state of that molecule. The point here is, you can, again uh, in this paper, relate this to an energy potential landscape at this one. Ground state, excited state, a different excited state, here a high spin, here a low spin, for instance. I'm sorry, here a low spin, here a high spin. Different spin states. This would be inter-system crossing. The point here is, that is made in 2003 and still is a topic of current research and part of LCLS research is, if we can make this state to live long, we can efficiently make use of the electron hole pair that we have created in our system. We can use it to make another molecule. We can use it in form of energy, chemical energy or whatever. If the system relaxes and loses energy, from here to here it loses energy, that is a portion of the energy we lost, we can't use anymore. So the point is, how does the system relax? How can we prevent it from relaxing? How can we make efficient use of um, that photon energy? Everything we've discussed so far is static. We haven't included any motion in our system. And in the last two slides, before we come to our first quiz, I want to discuss how to now include dynamics, motion, in our system. In order to do that, we need to make wave packets. Who has never heard of wave packets? Who has heard of wave packets? Ah, good. The first question is not so easy to answer in public. Anyway, so again, in this lecture, Nobel lecture paper by the while, you will see how the vibrations of a system in a harmonic potential vibration ground, level, ground state, can be described by wave packets. You, you do this um, coherent superposition of vibrational states, which means you form a nuclear wave packet, and the wave packet is evolving in time. If you let this run, you can easily simulate that on your computer, you will see how this, how this red thing will move back and forth between the walls, between the potential walls. That is nuclear motion, vibration, described by a wave packet. In order to do that, you have to superpose plane waves with a constant phase relationship here and here. And when you do that, you can, for instance, describe a free particle. This would be um, from this excellent book from Atkins and Friedman, Molecular Quantum Mechanics, a free particle, um, the wave function as a function of t, uh, as a time, uh, at a time t1, at a time t2, at a time t3, and you will see how it moves in space. This is the wave function. If you square it, you will get something like that. This can also be done for dissociative states. When the thing moves apart from each other, you have to superpose um, vibrational states coherently, and by that, you will get motion in the energy potential, the potential energy landscape. In the end, you arrive at this. We have a reaction coordinate, we have a potential energy, Often, actually, it's important to find out what the reaction coordinate is. In a diatomic molecule, it's just a distance. In a molecule with 25 atoms or 2,000 atoms, it's quite, a, quite hard to actually find out what the reaction coordinate is. And part of the research is to determine the reaction coordinate. But anyway, with these wave packets, we come to this. We pump the system. We promote the wave packet to the electronic excited state. It moves back and forth, and sometimes if it comes over the barrier, it can dissociate to, for instance, large distances. This is a, one of the representations that you currently or often see in uh, presentations at scientific conferences to describe molecular dynamics. What's important as well, and I'm not going into detail here, I refer again to the extra slides, is to make sure we understand the differences of all those different things. 
If the system is along this line, we talk about transient configurations. This would be an intermediate state. It has a certain lifetime. It stays there for a certain time and the energy is larger than kT, otherwise it wouldn't be a transient state. This here, all the way at the top of this local maximum, is a transition state. These would be again transient configurations and there could be internal vibrational redistribution, inter-system crossing or internal conversion, all the things that could contribute to the relaxation and going to different states that could lie here or here. This is the essence of describing molecular dynamics conceptually with a few fundamentals from textbooks. And with this, I would like now to come to the quiz part and get ready for the microphone. I will need you here. The first question is to make sure that we sensitize each other. I sensitize you for certain problems. As, as I said, it's not an input-driven lecture. It's really the, the goal is to sensitize you for certain things. So how many drawings in one do we have here? If you shout, I can hear you. Numbers. Yes? Five. Five. OK. Be before you go on, maybe, maybe other numbers? Ten. Well, I don't mean every, you know, every line to be a drawing. Maybe that's a misunderstanding. Conceptually, how many different things are we showing? I believe ten is too much. Two, okay. I would like to start with you with a two and then go on with you with a five, okay? Is that okay? Six. Six. Let's, let's, let's do the way I just suggested. What are the two? Well, there are force wave functions. Right. Correct. And the hypothesis of parabola is the energy distribution. Well, the energy is a function The potential. Right. How about you? That, that's correct. Something is missing, uh, missing I believe. Uh, the same idea, except I took each energy level as a separate. Aha. Fine. Let's put that together in one concept. But you said what's missing in his concept, that's energy levels. There are three, I believe there are three drawings. One is the shape of the harmonic potential. The other one is energy levels of the harmonic oscillator. Each line is an energy level, as you said. And we have the wave functions. This may sound trivial, but it's absolutely essential for you to realize that we're, we're actually stressing us a lot by drawing those three things in one. We're putting a lot of information into one drawing. And they don't belong to each other, actually. You should make a separate drawing, but you know it's convenient, and we do it. So get sensitized to that, please. The other question is, what's wrong here? That's a quick one, a simple one. Aha. This part? Yes, the, I'm sorry, yes. The shape of the wave packet will change, absolutely. Correct? That is not included here. What else? Something more fundamental. Yes, that's, I believe, what he meant. This is part of his answer. Something even more simple. Look at that part. It's going up and down. It shouldn't. It should move horizontally. There is no way we can, if we can, in this bonn hopman approximation, you know, change electronic into kinetic energy. That's not the point. We're just moving horizontally in one line. If at all you want to draw that, because this already is stretching a lot, the concept. OK? Again, a simple question, but not so simple to detect. Spot the different pictures, concepts, approximations in this. And I would like to throw at you something I'm obsessed about, like some other people in the X-ray community. Hidden in here is the one electron orbital picture, and at the same time, the many electron total energy picture. If you could spot where the one electron and where the many electron picture is, that would be great. Correct. 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 This is a very important um, uh, thing to realize. The thick lines here is the total energy of my system. 
And the boxes are orbitals with different energies, higher energy up there, lower energy down there. And the population is shown with these arrows. And this is really essential because if you start interpreting your experiment with this, you will fail. You have to start interpreting it with this and then reduce it to this. You will see an example in the, in the third part of my lecture. What's actually the time resolution I need to resolve molecular motion? Correct, femtoseconds, but the question is of course why? Because that's the time scale at which atoms are moving, sure. How do you come to that result without doing an experiment? You can't just go to Mike Dunn and say, hey, I would like to resolve molecular motion, give me femtoseconds and we see whether it works. You have to show him that you actually thought about it. So how do you estimate that? Tell me how you estimate that the time resolution you need is femtoseconds. Tell me how you estimate that atoms are moving on the femtosecond time scale. Look at the vibrational yes. Correct? Yeah, I have it on my list. I have three concepts on my list to estimate that. That's one of them. I just see at which, you know, on which time scale atoms are moving in a stretch vibration, for instance. Yes, what else can we do? Take energy coupled wavelengths. Oh. That's exactly what he said. The wavelength of an oscillatory motion, take the time it takes, and then you have it. Yes? Correct. Correct. That's correct. You take the speed of sound and I will show you in detail. One last one, one last one that I know of and I think one could be used is missing. Do we get it? You think about an experiment with a microscope, some little nanospheres in water, you look at them, we'll see Brownian motion. You can apply this concept to atoms too. We'll see it in a second. The most two common have been ma mentioned. Take the speed of sound, resolve the corresponding displacements. Pe speed of sound is several hundred to 1,000 meters per second. This corresponds to resolving 0.1 to 1 angstroms per 100 femtoseconds. Easy. Now you convinced Mike Dunn that you need 100 femtosecond pulses. Take the oscillation period of a molecule. Uh, resolve the oscillatory motion. For instance, a wavelength of 3 microns for the OH stretch vibration in a water molecule corresponds to very simple calculation, 10 to minus 14 uh, seconds or 10 femtoseconds. You need 10 femtosecond resolution in order to resolve this motion. And the third one is take the Brownian motion. You want to resolve the mean square displacement. This is the formula as it has been derived also with T temperature, particle radius and viscosity from Albert Einstein and those two uh, gentlemen. And you will find that a displacement of one angstrom takes 100 femtoseconds. Surprisingly close, the different approximations or estimations. But the essence here is don't forget to think and um, try to actually estimate what you get first before you propose an experiment. How fast do electrons actually move? I'm sorry? Yeah. That's correct. I would like you to first ask the question, why do I actually care on which time scales electrons are moving? Well, the point is classically the electron takes 100 attoseconds, 150 attoseconds to circulate the proton. And this is one way of estimating the time scale of electronic motion. I need attoseconds resolution, as you said. However, do I actually want to follow the rearrangement of electrons as nuclei are moving? Then I need femtosecond time resolution. That's not, a, that's not an easy question. How big is the mistake we make when calculating the energy of a state within the Born-Oppenheimer Born -Oppenheimer approximation? It's important because you should think about the, the error you're making with an approximation. How big is the error you're making within the, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation? On slide 11. We had masses of electrons in nuclei are different. That's your number. And the point is very simple. Here's our Schrodinger equation. You just take a textbook, for instance this one, look up 
the full one, the full Schrödinger equation, you will find this one for the electrons, kinetic energy and potential energy. You will find the part, it's all one equation, right? Here equals E psi, um, electronic and nuclear wave function, and you will find this mess down here, which is neglected in the von Hardenheimer approximation. Look at the numbers, M1, M2 are the masses of um, the nuclei. M1 equals M2 if the nuclei are the same, and M0 is the mass of the electron. And the difference in the order of magnitude for the energies we're talking about here is actually the 10 to minus 4. That's the error you're making, and it's not a very, very big error. So that really is a nice approximation. Last question for the quiz before we go on. What do you see? Describe. What do you see? Yes? That's a very complicated answer. Anyone? Even more complicated. I'm sorry to interrupt. Even more complicated. You're all correct. What do we see? Say it again. Louder. Yes? As complicated? Also complicated, but correct. We see colored, I'm sorry? Aha! We see colored spheres moving, yes. That's the point. Think about what you see. It is a molecular dynamic simulation. It's been done by my colleague in Stockholm. And it's the, 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 the reaction we're going to see in the last part. We studied at LCLS, yes, but in essence, it is colored spheres. Where are actually the electrons here? They certainly are not colored bars. Look where iron, you know, the color changes in the middle or something. I like them, and it's very important to have them, those ball and stick models. But they don't show the essence. Where are the electrons? Okay? And this is what LCLS can be for to show where the electrons are as the chemical reaction proceeds. Now you can lean back again. We'll do a quick tour through um, part number two. And this is about this elephant. How did that happen? How did that happen that this elephant apparently fell down here and then you see this carrot still flying or something? Well, you would have expected if you had planned this experiment maybe to, to the elephant to fly in that way. And this, is an, uh, um, the, this alludes to the cat falling always on, on, on its feet. Um, ideally, the, the elephant even catches the carrot and that in the, that's a very important intermediate state. Or maybe this one where it catches the carrot and still lands on the feet. It still it didn't. Is it a stupid elephant? Does it always happen that way? We don't know. So that is actually um, what time, resolu time resolution is all about. It's about resolving transient in intermediate states. And why do we need short pulses? What is actually short? It's not about elephants, but it's about horses. And I have to say that here because it just happened a few meters actually away, right, in the 19th century. It may be the birthday of ultra-fast technology. The bet between these two people, Leland Stanford, founder of Stanford University, and um, uh, I believe he gave the money for it, basically, to, be, to, to start the whole thing. Does a galloping horse have all four hooves in the air at, the, at, inst, at any instant? And answering this question could make sure that we don't have to see such things anymore, because it's, it looks a bit weird. The question is why? Well, all, you know, all hooves are, are in air, but I mean, is that really how horses run? It's, it looks strange. No, it's not by taking snapshots of galloping horses. This um, gentleman here um, that I never know how to pronounce was able to show that there is one instant when all four hooves are in the air, and that is when the feet are together, not apart from each other. That's very important to actually know. The time resolution at the time was 17 milliseconds. You can stick those images, photographs from the time together and get a movie. This is what we're talking about, movies. You can do it also with uh, buffaloes or elephants. It's, there's probably always a scientific question related to it. Here we talk about atoms. So let's see um, first in this part two how we can resolve transient states. And that will be done on the most simple system, a diatomic homonuclear <coughs> molecule, bromine, falls apart on a time scale of 100 femtoseconds, and you see how the valence orbitals are changing. 
The idea is very simple. You excite the system, it dissociates, and the molecular orbitals change as, as a function of time towards the atomic orbitals, and we want to resolve that. We want to see that. I don't have time to show you the details. It's an experiment that's done with valence photoelectron spectroscopy. We have 23 fem, um, EV pulses from a high harmonic generation uh, source in the lab. Uh, duration of the pulse is 120 femtoseconds. And what we come up with is how the energy of the different states evolve into the states of the free atoms after some time. These are the spectra, a broad spectrum of the excited state coming close together into this two-peak spectrum of the, at, uh, of the atom, of the free atom. Experiment and calculation. And here you see in the nice correspondence of experiment and calculations how the excited states, and there are numerous ones, there, there are many, even a diatomic molecule, change as a function of time, shift by more than four electron volts into the states of the free atom. This basically is an indirect representation of how the valence molecular orbitals change as a function of time from molecular to atomic orbitals, okay? That was a fast run through this scientific part and now I would like to torture you again. Which one actually applies? Can you detect the differences between left and right? What's the fundamental difference? Can I ask you? Correct. Let's say both include the spatial information, just for the sake of simplicity. Molecule, molecules at atomic distance in the molecule, free atoms, and some intermediate distances in between. No, no, no. You were on the right track before. That's why I chose you. I'm sorry. What's the fundamental difference? Yes. Yes. Imagine there is no arrow, no wave packets, no colored balls, nothing. Does that have to do with the one electron? Yes. Electron? Correct. Tell me. The right is the one electron. Yeah. The box indicates the other one shows. Correct. Exactly. Very important to realize this. Again, this is the whole energy of the whole molecule. This is just orbital energies of one, two, three, four orbitals. It's ridiculously simplified. The connection is obvious. Here's the nuclear distance. This is why I said there is nuclear distance in, in both somehow. This is orbital energy, and they are related by Koopman's theorem, which states that the first ionization energy of a molecular system is equal to the negative of the orbital energy of the highest occupied molecular orbital homo, just for you. Think about it. It's not so easy, and usually it doesn't work. Because you take out an electron, the system reacts to the fact that there's an electron missing, and the single electron approximation breaks down. It's just still very intuitively accessible and useful. Realize that there is a huge difference in representing your system between here and here. What's the time resolution we need? How would you, now that we left behind atoms, Think about it here. That may be a bit complicated now. Let me, let me just explain it, or say what I mean. You remember this plot from Svanberg's book on atomic and molecular spectroscopy. We're interested in the red box in the EV range, how many electron volts systems that absorb many electron volts are actually evolving in time. And um, what you now have to think about is the concept of, of a Fourier transform limited pulse. If you do that, you can write down the pulse length and the energy resolution, if you want, in your experiment, in this very simple formula. Pulse length times, um, times energy width equals 1.85 electron volts femtoseconds. That's one of those famous formulas physicists like to write down. It's nonsense in a sense that there is a number and two, and two units and well, what the hell is that? It's one of those very useful formula where you can just plug in numbers and get out something useful. For instance, you could have a 20 femtosecond pulse 
con um, correlating with an 0.1 EV bandwidth. I think that will be useful because the system may absorb four electron volts, but it may change by half an, uh, half an electron volt only. So make sure that your bandwidth is not too large. Using one fem to two femtosecond pulses would mean you have an EV bandwidth. And with a, with a pulse of one electron volt bandwidth to resolve a, a change of 0.5 EV, 0.1 EV, your signal to noise may not be great, is not so easy. 100 attoseconds or 200 attoseconds is a disaster for many techniques because you would have 10 electron volts bandwidth, okay? This is the point of this slide. Now let's come to the third part and there's a little uh, short uh, quiz at the end. <clears throat> now that we saw how to resolve, how we see transient states, we'd like to come to resolving intermediate states and why that is important. I would like to, um, this is the third part, where you see these people and one that I sing loud and the story about these people is this one. This is Igor Stravinsky, photographed by Richard Avedon in one of his books um, on his photography. I like this series because it's, it's a series of three snapshots, how Igor Stravinsky apparently starts looking at you. Here he's just looking at your feet or something. Here he looks right into your eyes, and this is a strange intermediate state, very complicated. One eye seemed to be looking at you while the other one is not very, very subtle details that change the whole perception here of one person and realize that it's only the eyes that are changing. All the rest in the face is like fixed, okay? One detail in one person changes the perception completely. Now, if you go to Tokyo and you watch this street crossing, you will see how many people start moving as the lights are getting green. They're moving, 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 and so on. This could be considered a chemical reaction. And there are many different pathways. Major pathways like this one, this one, and this one. There's a minor pathway because there's always some people who don't want to go along the main pathways. They choose to have this one here and see the dashed here. Oh. Anyway, like in every chemical reaction, there's always molecules that don't want to run along the main pathway, okay? The point here is we don't see the lines on the floor usually. Those lines on the floor is what we want to resolve. We want to resolve the pathways. We just, we just see the people. And we don't even see all of them at the same time. We just see one person. And then maybe an ensemble, two, three, many, as a function of time, the longer we accumulate. So how can we actually possibly, from the subtle differences in one person, in one species, in one molecule, deduce the whole reaction pathways? That is, that is the challenge if you talk about chemical reactions, the relevant chemical reactions, the, one in, the ones in solution, for instance. So the point here is, how can we pick out a specific signal from a soup of molecules? This is what you have to be obsessed about if you want to study these systems or these problems. How can we be selective? And the answer to that question is, of course, x-rays. Here we talk about X-ray spectroscopy. That's why I'm focusing on X-ray spectroscopy, the answer. Joe Sturr, a former, um, a former um, director at the lab um, and Stanford faculty always asked the question in every talk, why are you actually using X-rays for that? And it's a good question. Think about why should you use X-rays? Here we talk about why should we use X-ray spectroscopy? It's to single out specific species from a soup. Spectroscopy with X-rays allows us to be element site and orbital specific. We'll see how. And this allows us to draw un unique conclusions on how coordination or structure, charge and spin density change as a function of time. And for that, we need tunable, short and intense X-ray pulses. I will focus on soft X-ray pulses, but it's more or less similar for the hard X-ray range. This is the energy landscape you need to understand if you want to now understand X-ray spectroscopy. Here's our ground state. Here's valence excited states. We excite the system. It evolves down here. This is where the chemistry happens. Down there on a few EV electron level. This is what characterizes bonding down there. This is what we're interested in. When we do time-resolved X-ray absorption, time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy, we use core excited states. 
we take out electrons from the core, put them to the valence electrons, for instance, or take them out completely in photoelectron spectroscopy. We look at core excited states, but it just, it's just the probing. There are people who are interested in the dynamics in the core excited states. We don't talk about here. Uh, we don't talk about that here. The probing is using the core excited states, being able to distinguish different elements and different species because those levels are shifted. Few EV level, that is what we're interested in. The experiment we did quite some time ago is very simple. You take a liquid jet, you put this molecule iron pentacarbonyl, an iron molecule in the middle, five COs around, prototypical coordination compound, at a one mole per liter in ethanol solution, you spray it or push it into your vacuum. We talk about soft x-rays, that's why vacuum. You pump the system with a pump laser and you probe it with femtosecond soft x-ray pulses from LCLS. You could detect electrons or photons. We decided to detect photons because it's a bit easier to do that with solutions. We basically detect the energy of the scattered photons, soft x-ray photons in. We have a dispersive spectrometer, a grading with a detector that disperses the scattered um, radiation. You imagine the green light being scattered. Now it's in yellow, don't ask. And you disperse it with a grading and you record the spectrum. What you do is resonant inelastic X-ray scattering or RICS, as Mike already alluded to in the morning. Here, we look at what happens if we rip off a CO from that molecule. Nominally, this system is missing two electrons that were taken away by the ligand. That's what textbooks tell you. And this is also this missing electron density here is what determines the reactivity of this system. We wanted to know how the system behaves when the CO has left. What happens to it in solution? What does it do? We do resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. Except for the, bl the red blob here, you will find these representations in textbooks. This is a representation that shows resonant or non-resonant Raman scattering, because that's what we're talking about. RIGS is the X-ray analog of resonance Raman scattering. We're coming in with a photon energy, Hanu in, we're getting out with Hanu out, and that promotes our system from an initial to a final state. This is, for instance, from Demtröder Laser Spectroscopy, an excellent book. You, you see the similarities, you come in with uh, H bar omega i, go out with H bar omega s, and you promote the system from EI to EF. That's your molecule. This is our system, a metal bound to molecules. And the essence here is the arrows go to the metal atom because with the core resonance, we can, by tuning the photon energy, choose to only look at the metal. We don't look at the whole system. We look at the metal. We could also tune to the, to the resonance of the molecule, of the ligand, to only look at the ligand. Here in this experiment, we decided to only look at the metal. This is one of the big advantages of X-ray spectroscopy. You select elements, sites in your system. You select elements by looking at different core electron binding energies or tuning your, your resonance, your, 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 your energy to different resonances. Or you look at different sites and what's behind that is a whole lecture again on the so-called chemical shift, electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis. Um, Kai Siegmann got the Nobel Prize in, uh, I forgot when, for this, um, for this discovery, how core electron binding energies change with chemical environment. Core electron binding energies of one element. This is how you select site. Anyway, um, this is again a level diagram you can find in textbooks. For the X-ray regime, we're going from the ground state to a core excited state and back to um, a valence excited state. For the Stokes case, for the anti-Stokes case, we start from a valence excited state, go through a core excited state and come back to the ground state. Very conceptual and nothing new except that I just put those names here. Now, I switch. This is the one electron picture. And I want to tell you what we actually do when we go from the ground state to a core excited or valence excited state. This is a metal core orbital, iron 2P in our case, for instance. And these are homo and lumo. This is occupied, this is unoccupied. That's why they're called like that. Um, in the Stokes case, we take an electron from the core level, we put it to the lumo, and we can have a decay of an electron or an electron from the homo filling back that core level. You see how the system is left in a valence excited state. This is the Stokes case. The anti-Stokes case, 
we would start from a valence from this valence excited state. Then we have a, um, a smaller energy reson resonance. We can fill this here and we can take this electron to go down and we arrive at the ground state. This is the anti-Stokes case. So this is a simplistic uh, correlation between one electron transitions and the many electron picture for resonance Raman scattering. Let's apply it. Ach so, what I completely forgot is we learned how to select elements. We learned how to select sites. And here we see how to select orbitals. We just tune our resonance, our photon energy, to either the LUMO or the HOMO. And by that, we select orbitals in our system. We select orbitals by tuning to the respective resonances. Let's apply this to FeCO5. In order to do that, we have to very briefly understand sigma bonding and pi back donation. Very fundamental concept in chemistry. And I just want to tell you that in these systems, <clears throat> There is electron density going from the ligand to the metal and electron go density going back from the, from the metal to the ligand. This change, exchange of electrons makes the covalent bond between iron and, and carbon monoxide. Okay, Five times and you have a molecule. You can translate this into this molecular orbital diagram. It's the same thing we've seen before. Atom, atom, molecular orbital, molecular orbital, just this time for this more complex molecule. Simplified again, in reality, it's more complicated. But here, the essential part is the sigma donation part, where the density goes from the ligand to the iron, lets these two levels interact and split into these two, whereas a pi back donation from the metal to the ligand makes this here split into the two pi um, star and this uh, level down here. The point here is you have occupied and unoccupied energy levels. Those are the frontier orbitals. LUMO here, lowest unoccupied. HOMO, highest occupied. Those are the ones we're interested in. The frontier orbitals are the ones that most strongly react to changes in chemical bonding. We would like to directly probe them. And that's what we're doing with, with RICS. If you just look at this here, and then you imagine down here somewhere in the cellar a 2p level in the one electron diagram, the 2p electron would be down here in energy, the 2p orbital energy. You could promote the 2p orbital, uh, the 2p electron, I'm sorry, to the LUMO. That would be this resonance from 2p to this d sigma star to the LUMO. And then you could have electrons from either here or here to fill back the hole. This would be this transition, d pi or 5 sigma, filling back the hole. What you effectively do is you probe the blue transitions, 1 and 2. Because first you put an electron from here to here, then you put an electron from there to there, all are filled again, here one is missing, which means effectively you put an electron from here to here. You probe the LUMO d pi to d sigma star transitions indirectly by involving a core resonance. Or you can probe um, this transition number two. You can also put your electron, not in this, but in this one, the 2p electron, there's a second X-ray resonance if you want. And then again, fill the hole from this or this, and you would effectively probe transitions three and four. So what we expect to see in our system FeCO5 is two X-ray resonances and four Riggs peaks. Two X-ray resonances, one in, uh, A and B, and four Riggs peaks, one, two, three, and four. This is for convenience, again, the, the MO diagram, and this is our experimental observable. This is intense, measured now at LCLS, intensity in color, where one is red and green is zero, as a function of energy transfer, which is just the difference between ingoing and outgoing photon energy, because we're doing an inelastic scattering experiment, and as a function of incident energy around the iron L3 edge, 2p electron excitations. And what you see is two resonances. Now, integrate in your head, not so easy, the intensities everywhere here, integrate them all along incident energy, and you will get this spectrum. That's, that's an absorption spectrum. You see two resonances, A and B, as expected, from 2P to LUMO and LUMO plus 1. And you see 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, and 4 Riggs peaks, corresponding to the four Riggs transitions we saw. Everything on the line at 0 is elastic scattering, which we're not interested in at the moment. The calculations nicely represent that, and you can easily now identify um, this one, that's the most important one here, which is effectively this transition here from uh, HOMO to LUMO, that's the one we're interested in. 
um, d pi to d sigma star. This one is the one we're interested in. Some peaks are missing because um, the orbitals were not included in the calculation. It took three years to actually e develop that theory after we did the experiment, which was a mistake. We should have developed the theory first, but uh, you never know. So that's what we measured. We measured the difference between HOMO and LUMO in our experiment. The energy of peak one, ref here, this three electron volts, reflects this energy. And that is wonderful, because if you now think about it, CO and FeCO4 making FeCO5, they go apart from each other. This is what we expect to see. As the system goes away, as the, as the CO goes away from, as the CO goes away from FeCO4, we expect those two levels to move closer to each other. We expect the Rick's energy of peak one to decrease. This is again the observable for FeCO5. Let's just focus on this blob, which is the, the HOMO to LUMO transition, d pi to d sigma star transition, and this is what we see. We had to integrate for time delays of 0 to 700 femtoseconds because signal to noise was just good enough to do the experiment, as in every experiment, somehow in the end, right? Um, we would have liked to display those RICS maps, we call them, for 20 femtosecond steps or so, but we couldn't. But it's still valuable to have it for 0 to 700 femtoseconds, and you see how the blob is moving down in energy from 4 electron volts to close to 0. That's exactly this coming together of HOMO and LUMO as the thing dissociates. At the same time, you see how the X-ray resonance goes from 710 to 7.7. Seven. And this, this is of course understandable because if this thing is going down, look at that, Oops. your X-ray resonance will also decrease in energy. It's the same thing. Now, we have maps for different time delays. We actually have temporal information, how the intensity evolves for every pixel you see here. So this is at 0 to 700, 700 to 3,500 or 3.5 picoseconds, and you see how intensities are changing. This is increasing, this is decreasing, and so on and so on. This is valuable information that tells us about the dynamics of that system and intermediate states in our system, and I will show you how. Two or three slides that are a bit complicated. This is again FeCO5 and the calculation, and now one electron orbital diagram to show the spin state. These are our products at early delays, and you see how this blob moves down in energy transfer and incident energy. If you do the calculation, you leave the system in a singlet. You see these two spins are antiparallel. It's a singlet state. You just take away the CO. You would expect this blob to move down in energy here to this energy instead of here, and you would expect to move it down in incident energy, as we just discussed. However, it doesn't end up where the experiment is. There is a shift of 2 EV missing. This is where the experiment is. This is where the calculation is. You can only reconcile this by assuming in addition that first, um, there is intensity. I will go through this slowly. Yeah, there are regions A, B, and C. Let me do it this way. A, B, and C, where there is a mismatch between the simple calculation and the experiment. We don't have intensity at negative energy transfers in our calculation. We don't have the intensity at the right place at B, and we don't have the increase we saw before at this point C. In order to reproduce this, we first postulate RICs from an excited state. This is anti-Stokes RICs. This contributes to negative energy transfers. You start from an excited state, and the outgoing photon energy is higher than the incoming. That's why the energy transfer is negative. And this is this little blob down here. It's a singlet excited state of our molecule. Second, B suddenly is reproduced if we assume that the system changed FeCO4 now from a singlet, parallel spins, antiparallel spins down here, to a triplet. There has to be, there had, there has to be a, uh, we have to assume an inter-system crossing in our system in order to reproduce our experimental observable. And third, we can reproduce the intensity in region C here by assuming a ligated structure where the, the reactive FeCO4 caught a solvent molecule and bound in order to make this strange complex here. 
we didn't calculate only three structures. We calculated 70 or so, the maximum amount possible in a few years. Ideally, you would ca calculate hundreds of thousands along an MD molecular dynamics trajectory, which is not, not the point, uh, which is not possible today. 70 was enough to see the systematics and to uniquely determine that the lowest energy structures, and these are the structures with the lowest energies of those 70s, are just sufficient to describe our experimental observable. Um, this is, by the way, the bonding uh, diagram for FEC now centered on, on FECO4. Here is forming FECO5, and here is forming this FECO4 ethanol um, uh, ligated structure where you take a sigma orbital from ethanol to make this complex, you push apart those two again, and this is what explains that um, you have this blob at higher energies than for the, for the FECO4 structures here. We come to that. Every pixel contains temporal information. We had to average over certain pixels because signal to noise in each pixel wasn't good enough. If we draw boxes A, B, and C, and we display their intensity as a function of time, we get those data, those data here, and we can, we can fit them with a kinetic model that display now the temporal evolution of the excited state, the ligated state, and the triplet state. The point here is, and that is very short, we can derive a potential energy landscape from that. Unfortunately, nowadays, it's impossible to calculate this. If there is people who have a, a tendency to go towards theory, we desperately need that. The experiments nowadays are actually easily done. The calculations are not so easy to do. It is impossible to calculate, still impossible, people are working on it, to calculate this energy potential, potential energy landscape. There are many details here which tell us about how fast the electronically excited state is evolving, how intersystem, I'm sorry, how intersystem crossing is happening, why is that happening so fast? It's happening on a, on a 200, 300 femtosecond time scale, and why can actually this ligation happen so fast? All still unsolved and open questions, but um, we detect them, and I don't want to go into detail. I just want to note one thing. From our, um, instead of talking about complicated potential energy landscapes, which actually is the essence, we learn that if we rip apart the molecule within two to 300 femtoseconds, this electron deficiency here is saturated either by a shape change, that would be um, the conversion from this excited singlet state to this triplet state. It just moves together to somehow saturate the electron deficiency. 40% of the molecules approximately do that. 60% of them on a 200 femtosecond time scale just catch a solvent molecule to saturate the electron deficiency. So we're trying to translate the balls and sticks, you, you see the colored bar again here, in terms of population and energies of orbitals. That's the point. And we can actually derive a very simple rule. On the left-hand side, that's why I grouped it in this way, on the left-hand side you can see how FeCO4 with CO forms a complex, FeCO4 with the solvent forms a complex. They bind, they are reactive in terms of binding something. On the right-hand side, the singlet of FeCO4 doesn't want to bind on the few picosecond time scale. And the triplet FeCO4 also doesn't want to bind anything on the few picosecond time scale. And the reason is very, very simple. In those two, the D sigma star orbital is unpopulated. And it's empty to accept electron density from the ligand to form this ligated structure. In these two cases, it's populated. And that prevents the system of efficiently transferring electrons into the orbital and forming a complex. So by probing the orbitals and their population, we can actually derive very simple rules in terms of reactivity of our system. And that is what we are after, because that's the essence, that's what we need to explain the reactivity of our systems. Summarizing, femtosecond X-ray pulses allow us to access localized core orbitals, very simply. And with this, we can deduce, derive valence electronic structure locally at the metal or at the ligand by just tuning the photon energy. Um, together with nuclear structure, we can derive the function on the atomic length scale of atoms, angstroms, I'm sorry, and on the atomic length time scale of femtoseconds. And what's behind, and you should always remember your textbooks, is really this very simple thing, radial probability distributions in hydrogen. 
1s, 2p, those are the core orbitals that we like to probe, are localized, while 3d, the valence electrons, the valence orbitals in an iron, in a 3d metal, for instance, making the bonds, are completely delocalized. And that is the whole essence of X-ray spectroscopy, including time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy. A few slides to the quiz, and then we're done. Let me check the time to make sure. What is shown here in case one, two, three, and four? Three and four relate to laser, um, uh, to, to maybe a lecture on lasers, but still, that's, it's nice to see um, the connection to what we're discussing here. Now you. Correct. What are the blobs? What are the, what are the spheres? Correct. Now maybe someone else. What is this? Is it the one? Both are either the one or the many electron pictures. What are they? We're talking about inversion population in a system to explain stimulated emission and how laser operation is actually going on. What are we showing then? You certainly all had in some way lectures on lasers. Is it the one or the many electron picture? Many. What are the, what are the spheres? Good question. I wonder. I always wonder when I see these spheres. I think what the authors want to say is, we have a system with a certain electronic structure shown here in the many electron total energy picture. Fully correct. The number of spheres, though, I believe, represents the number of atoms in a certain state. Completely different to here, right? It's an ensemble. This suddenly is an ensemble of atoms. It represents the distribution of atoms in an ensemble of atoms. Many atoms in this state, not so many in this one. So always think about what the lines are and what the balls are. Otherwise, you're completely lost. What's the difference? To make it simple, I take away all the stuff. We had it. I think someone said it. Maybe you, I don't remember. It, correct. And it's both the many electron picture. OK? Good. So where are? We don't have a board to draw, that's sad, but where are the arrows for X-ray absorption spectroscopy and RIGS? Tell me in words where to draw the arrows. We excite the system, for instance, to here. Now we do X-ray absorption from here. Where do I have to draw the arrow to? All the way to the blue one. Good, let's do that. I'm sorry. Now you saw it. And the RIGS comes down to the valence excited state. And what's essential to realize here is we let the system evolve. We go all the way down, all the way up to the blue. This one or this one, we have X-ray absorption spectrum. Now we look at the energy that's scattered. That would be this one coming down to, for instance, the ground state. We subtract them from each other. This would be the anti-Stokes case, negative energy transfer, incoming smaller than outgoing. We always do incoming minus out, minus outgoing. And this little arrow is the core lifetime. The core excited state, on average, lives as long as the core lifetime is. Like, hmm? So you call it scattering. Why don't you call it fluorescence? Very good question. This is exactly the point to ask that question. Why do I not call it X-ray fluorescence? When should I call it resonant X-ray um, emission spectroscopy or resonant X-ray fluorescence? When should I call it RIGS? Tell me. There are different answers to the question. One is if you have different pathways that go from here to here, 
through different resonances and you always arrive at the same final excited state, final valence excited state. Then you have to, maybe, depends on the system, include or take into account interference effects. The fact that you go through different intermediate states to the final state. When is that relevant to include? I believe the easy answer is it's relevant to include that if things happen during the coral lifetime. Take an OH bond in water. Many people over the years have done rigs of H2O in water, in the gas phase, in, in, in liquid, whatever. You, it's the same energy potential, potential energy landscape. You do the first step, and as you are here, you arrive in a very steep potential. The hydrogen starts flying off immediately on a time scale of few femtoseconds. In this conceptually simple discussion, you have to do RICS, you have to call it RICS in that moment. Because on the average lifetime of three to four femtoseconds in this core excited state, in some systems, the system, the, the bond is already elongated. Some are actually dissociated, some are not, depending on when the, when the, when the decay actually um, occurs. And there you have to include interference. If you talk about FECO, heavy atoms, nothing happens actually here. The coral lifetime is just a femtosecond or two, nuclei are heavy, while the system is in the core, in the core excited state, atoms, nuclei are not moving. And you're right, we could have given the whole talk just saying resonant X-ray emission. Yes. Now, the last question, maybe to the chemists. We saw the Riggs plane for FeCO5, and we saw the Riggs plane for this strange ligated complex FeCO4 with ethanol. In both cases, we said that the first blob is at high transfers. Now, if you compare in detail there, although it's you know, inhomogeneously broadened, homogeneously broadened, whatever, it's broad, but still the, the maximum seems to be at 3 point something, 3.5 EV for FeCO4 with ethanol. And it seems to be at 5 EV for FeCO5. And I want to know why. Why is the energy transfer that we measure larger in FeCO4CO compared to FeCO4 ethanol? I'm sorry, he, him, him, you, you, you already talked. Let, let him first, okay? I'm sorry. Okay, so then, uh, with the sigma, you have like large overlap. Yeah. So if you remove one of the, you remove one of the nucleons, basically, that energy will be more active because, like, like the energy will be pushed away than the last. Yes. So if that one is empty bonding. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is why this is horizontal. Correct? Yes. What about here? Why is this smaller than this? You're, you're absolutely right. And the problem is this is vastly simplified. Just based on this, you can't, you can't understand it. It's actually more complicated, and pi interactions play a role also for the difference of these two levels here. Here you have pi and sigma changing the difference here, and here you only have sigma interactions between, because ethanol just doesn't have a, a pi orbital to accept electrons from the iron. And this is why um, this is smaller than this, and the reason why we can't understand it is because this is vastly simplified. Anyway, in the end, it all comes down to seeing atoms. And um, some of you may do spectroscopy, some of you do, may do scattering, uh, crystallography, microscopy, whatever, want to see the atoms themselves. But the essence of this lecture is just don't forget the electrons. Don't forget what the colored bars are. I thank you. <laughs>